Okay, the last paper of the session is Efficient and Provable White Box Primitives by um, Pierre Alan Fug, Pierre Karpmanner, Paul Kirchner, and Brice Minot. And the talk is given by Pierre Karpmanner. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, you can notice that some of the keywords in the title are similar to the previous talk. Uh, I assume that Andre would do a very good job of introducing the context so I can go a bit faster. Uh, but basically, we have the same objective. Uh, as was said before, we want to have a log cipher uh, or something that will be incompressible. So this will somehow how we can define it uh, in a rather intuitive way. Let's say we have a block cipher, uh, mat call E, uh, taking a key, plain text, sending a cipher text. And uh, we want to define an incompressible implementation of these ciphers. So it's going to be this much BBE, like just a program. And uh, we, what we want is that if we're just given the implementation, it's hard to define another implementation, E prime, that give the same answer for all input outputs. And uh, that this program is much shorter. So the size, basically, of E prime is much smaller than the size of E. And uh, of course, we can relax a bit, like saying, we don't need that E and E prime need to be exactly the same. They can differ on some negligible size uh, of the input space. And also, we can say that this compression needs to be at least by a factor C. So to say I really compress, I need to compress by at least C. So this is basically the kind of thing we want to do. And uh, for a moment, for now, we will just uh, for a while define it as a rather encryption schemes because it for what follows, but it's just the same. We just uh, add some operating mode and some randomness, and uh, now we will define a white box encryption scheme as being a pair of encryption schemes. The first one takes a key split in two, key, key prime, randomness, place text, uh, and send to cipher text. Then we have this other uh, implementation of the scheme, and the, these two schemes are related by a white box compiler, which takes a value from the first domain K, sends it to the second domain T, which takes place of K in, uh, for this mat BB. And uh, then what we want is that the, the relation with this compiler is that uh, E and E BB are the same when the first parameter is K and the compiled version of K. And uh, for this to be useful in our context, we want these two domains K and T to be of very different size. And typically, we want to take a small K, like 128 bits, and a much bigger T like, for instance, 2 to the 16 bytes, or even bit. And uh, in our context and uh, in everything that also Andre presented, this uh, domain T for the white box implementation of the cipher can be thought of as a set of tables. Uh, so that's what we will assume for now. And this is what's been used, for instance, in Asasa space SPN box, and also in the schemes I will present. Uh, so now we have this white box encryption scheme uh, definition, and we should know how to attack it. So what does it mean to attack this kind of scheme? So we have black box attacks, which are really typical. We just fix uh, somehow like the, the instance by picking a certain K. Then we have something that purely classical, like a symmetric encryption scheme. We just attack it as we usually do. Uh, so we're not really interested in that uh, for this talk. And uh, then we have white box attacks, and we can somehow divide this in two kind of attackers, uh, which define a, somehow two strategies to compress uh, uh, E. So our goal is given E and C of K to try to find a smaller E prime. So we can do this in two ways. The first one is given C of K trying to get K. So this is what we will call the compiler adversary. And then we have a implementation, implementation adversary that doesn't really try to compress this C of K, but simply this C of K is a big table or a set of big tables. And what this adversary tries to do is to use fewer table inputs than what we would want. So basically saying I have this big table, but I, I don't need this entire table to uh, encrypt. I can just use a smaller part. So then we have two kind of strategies to, to decrease the size of the implementation. So, uh, well, now we actually don't really want to attack in this. Uh, well, this work was not about attacks, but rather building secure systems. 
So how can we protect against all of these adversaries? Uh, so against compiler adversaries, uh, there are two ways that Andre presented. The first well, that, that have been used so far, the first one is to build dedicated block ciphers and then to tabulate them. Uh, so that's what's been done for SPN Box, uh, typically, and also Asasa two years ago. And uh, then an attack is just to attack this small block cipher. So basically, you use tools from symmetric crypt analysis to assert that this is a secure or not block cipher. So Asasa got broken. SPN Box hopefully will not be. Uh, and then there is another strategy, which is the one used uh, in space that Andre also mentioned and that we use in this work, is that we start from a secure block cipher like AES, and we just somehow take an output and truncate it or not. And uh, so then we rely on the security of this big block cipher to, to say that uh, we cannot easily find the input from the output. Uh, okay, and then uh, implementation adversaries are a bit trickier in the sense that what we would want is to show that we have enough unpredictable accesses to the tables so that an adversary cannot easily say, I only need this part of the table uh, to uh, reach a full functionality or a significant functionality. So this is a bit harder to show. Uh, there, there is no easy way or at least easy methodology as before. Uh, okay, so now the goal is uh, to define uh, provably secure schemes um, in the sense that we have some kind of provable arguments against uh, these attacks I mentioned. Uh, so, and also we wanted uh, to have rather a family of schemes for which we can pick an implementation size because probably we want to be able to do that for uh, concrete applications. And uh, then now we go back to focusing more on the primitives uh, that can be used to achieve this uh, white box encryption scheme. So I will present a puppy cipher, block cipher, and four de bois, which is more like a function. Um, so the global strategy for this design is uh, first to get rid of the easy adversaries, uh, somehow like the black box adversary and the compiler adversaries. And then we focus uh, for the rest of this work implementation adversaries, and in this case, we define a security model, uh, well, actually two, I can go back to that. Uh, and uh, we can use this model to prove that the construction, uh, given reasonable assumption, is secure. Um, so, well, the first two adversaries, I won't mention again in this talk, are the ones that I call easy, because for black box adversaries, basically, if we get our entire scheme, we can always sort of make it uh, secure against black box adversaries by sandwiching a yes uh, So this may seem a bit like overkill or uh, tricking, but actually it's quite natural given our constructions. And then, well, the resulting scheme is never going to be less secure than the next. So this should be good. Uh, for compiler adversaries, uh, we do what I just mentioned briefly. We just take a yes with the secret key on some counter. We put that into a table, and then uh, if we cannot recover the, the AES key given a few in plain text, ciphertext uh, pairs, then this should be uh, secure in the sense that we cannot really. Uh, okay, so consider this to be done for now. And uh, now we really want to tackle uh, implementation adversaries. And for this, we first define a security model. Uh, so one of the, the we have a few variants. Paper and uh, now for this we assume uh, that the encryption white back encryption scheme uses this table. So it's necessary for this uh, model to actually make sense. And uh, okay, it's basically defined by this security game. So we have some parameters and we have a challenger B, which takes uh, uniformly some tables from this table space. And uh, then the adversary A can adaptively query this table on some inputs, but not the entire table restricted to picking S inputs, so he can get the answers. And now then B picks uh, fixes all of the remaining parameters of the scheme and uh, send this uh, to A, and A wins if it can encrypt. Uh, so now we're going to do this, uh, well, you can use it to define a security with this a security parameter, saying that the adversary shouldn't succeed in this game with the probability greater than um, okay, well, it was written, I didn't mention it on the, the slide before, it's a, 
what's called the weak model, and the source of weakness in this model is because we are assuming that the adversary behaves in a certain way. Namely, that the adversary strategy is to take the table outputs, input outputs, and to keep only some of them. But it's still, its way of compressing the implementation is by forgetting some elements of the table. So this looks like a reasonable strategy, but uh, in all generality, we cannot assume that the adversary uh, best strategy can be done like this. So we also have a strong model that I, I won't mention so much for the rest of the talk, but or you can generalize somehow this strategy by saying that the adversary will define an arbitrary function from this uh, table space, and will then later ask the challenger to give uh, to apply this function to the table depicts and get the entropy. And then the restriction is that this function should preserve some of the entropy uh, of uh, the, the challenger's table. So you can ask anything, but not too much. Uh, and then we can have some uh, the, the rest of the game somehow. Okay, so now I will first define the coureur de bois family, which is uh, mapping from some randomness to a key. So the idea of this kind of, why, why this kind of, uh, uh, primitive can be useful in a white box context is that the actual session key you use has to be defined through this function. So if you forget about this function, then you don't know exactly what the key should be used for. This. So at some point of the entire protocol, you force people to use a function that needs a lot of space. Um, and uh, so we have this construction uh, which meets uh, our requirements, and we can probably take care in this. Uh, Um, so the, what does it look like? So we have first a compilation phase where we just uh, tabulate AES with the secret key on some on a constant. So this defines a table with the two to the t plus four bytes where you can choose t. Uh, now uh, how it works is that we use our input, which is just a randomness, and uh, we use that uh, for the seed of AES counter with some well for the key. AES counter, and then we use some counter, we produce basically a sequence of pseudo-random uh, values that will be indices on which we access this big table. And, uh, so we get these uh, table values, outputs, we arrange them in, in the metrics, we generate some more randomness, and we compute this uh, mapping at the end, which is the result of the uh, So that's how it looks like on a picture. Uh, we get ER, so AES typically parameterized is R. We get the output of uh, some counter values into this. We get them into tables of 128 bit output. We gather everything in some sort of hash function that also uses some additional uh, random to the random input. And this defines uh, the key from the R seed. Um, okay, so the idea of uh, this your scheme and uh, how to prove that it's a good one uh, is that if we don't know one of the inputs to the tables, then we shouldn't be able to say anything about the output. So now how to prove that this indeed works, that the scheme uh, is is that we can show um, if the adversary is restricted to access to store only S values of the table, then show that it's bound to need one extra value that it doesn't have uh, with high probability. Uh, so that's the number of table, total table that needs to be accessed is basically what we need to compute uh, for a given security level. Uh, and this security level uh, will be set to be the output size, 128 bits, minus uh, the log of the total number of tables that are uh, kept by the adversary. Because this co would correspond to the adversary just uh, computing the scheme uh, for some input, uh, storing the values, well, the results, then forgetting everything, and then with S bits of memory, basically you can always just uh, compute on some random inputs, you will have some non well, probability greater than 2 to the minus 128 to get a value. So, well, not uh, that it's too, well, it is important, but not so necessary to understand it right away, but basically that also tells you that there is a strictly minimal number of rounds that are necessary, uh, that will be the ratio of compression times R uh, should be uh, less than two to the minus delta at the security. Uh, otherwise, you have some sort of generic uh, quite trivial. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so then what we actually show is that for this construction, if you add just one more round than this uh, strict minimum number of rounds, then you can reach uh, the security level that we see. Uh, so I will not detail the, the proof, but it's uh, somehow like defining bad events, counting how many, uh, how often those bad events can occur. Well, some kind of combinatorial magic. And uh, so that's what it looks like uh, concretely. If you use 16-bit uh, input tables, then you need 57 tables for a security level of 100 with uh, this compression ratio to the minimum. Okay. Um, so actually, for this construction, it's also possible to show that it's secure in this more in this stronger model where you don't assume so much about the strategy of the adversary. Uh, the way to do that is to explore the similarities between this entire kind of incompressible model and the uh, bonded storage model, uh, where somehow the goal are quite similar. So unsurprisingly, similar agreements can be used. And for this uh, proof, we use results from Adam and local extractors, which were developed for this uh, bonded storage model. Um, OK. So uh, now we briefly mention a puppy cipher family, which uh, is uh, now a typical block cipher, and, uh, which has similar properties as the one, which can be seen somehow as a sequence, being a sequential version of uh, this thing. Uh, okay, so I will skip this because there is a picture. Uh, basically, that's what's being done. Well, we get references, a message, and the message is split in two halves. One half is split further into some smaller uh, chunks of the size of uh, so input size of some tables. These go to the tables. The output of the table is 64 bit. All of these are exhort to the left half. So basically, that's a one round file step. And between each of the rounds, we have a full call to the AS uh, that is supposed to mix everything. So for instance, for puppy cipher 24, we do this 34 times. And um, at the end, we get uh, the encrypted uh, message. Um, so now we also need to fix the how many rounds of this construction are necessary to, be, to reach a given security level. And the profile is similar to Coureur de Bois. But it's a bit more complex, because now the inputs are not independent as before, as generated by a pseudo-random function, because they are changed through these sequences of uh, permutation. So uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, more work, and uh, there are the de details in the paper. So this is how many rounds table accesses we need for variance, variant instances. OK, so I will go quickly over implementation. Uh, so some nice features that we have uh, are that uh, if you look at the construction, all of the individual components are quite efficient. AES REM function that can be implemented efficiently. Uh, we have table accesses that somehow we need in those uh, settings and that are going to be, well, not necessarily efficient, but we'll, well, we have to pay for that at some point. And uh, the given number, the number of table accesses we need is uh, near minimal, uh, so it's not too bad. Uh, and also we have some kind of parallelism that we can get, especially for core one. And also, we propose a more aggressive version of Puppy Cipher, where we don't do full AES between each of the Feistel steps, but we reduce this type. Potentially, we could reach even fewer rounds, but uh, well. So those are some quick uh, results. Basically, so for the Puppy Cipher, we get from 175 to 1,460 cycle per bytes for these, uh, depending on the table size. So when, if it fits in cache, it's going to be reasonably efficient. If it's in RAM, of course, you have to pay a lot more. You have a lot of variance also between these table calls. If you reduce the, the number of AES calls, it's going to be a bit faster. Coureur de Bois is a bit faster, too, because uh, we get this parallelism between the table accesses. Uh, yeah. Uh, so OK, and uh, I will skip this. In the other room over here. Uh, okay, and uh, this was just this one slide saying that the um, well, the Andre also gave uh, figures for his construction in uh, in the last talk, and uh, the thing is that we were using slightly different uh, settings for our um, performance measurement. So that thing, it's quite not ready to compare exactly uh, how it can be. I mean, which one is the most efficient? 
So probably we need to look at this a bit more. But, uh, I mean, that's something that should be done now. Um, okay, so that's the end of my talk. And uh, so I put an engraving of some Coeur de Bois on the right and uh, the seventh cutest puppy according to Google Image. Any questions? I don't know. I mean, I first look at the other audience to give the chance to other people to ask questions. So, uh, a small thing which I'm not sure I understood correctly. When you are putting this extra uh, AES uh, in order to defeat, uh, for example, black box uh, uh, attackers, uh, you use a key. Uh, do you try to hide uh, that key in uh, any white box way? Or you just uh, give away the uh, the key in the AES, uh, which you put in the middle. Uh, so, to, so this key would be in the white box sense. This key is okay. Oh, well, it's not uh, protected. It's really like. So actually, we can. No, but then you cannot claim that you have uh, that you are secure in the black box uh, model if you think about uh, it as being known. No, no, but in the well, it's not known in the black box model. Uh, in the black box model, this key is secret. That, that would correspond also to these keys. Okay. So these keys are completely secret in a black box sense. And so that's why, it, that's why I said also this happens naturally for the construction. In a black box way, those are secret, so what you get in But in the white box, uh, it's uh, op completely open. You don't make any attempt to hide it uh, uh, from no, the uh, null. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank uh, all the speakers of the session. <laughs> we will have the coffee break till five past six, uh, five past four, which is in 25 minutes. <laughs>